Imagine it's 1908 and you're living in the Siberian wilderness. Suddenly, without warning, an asteroid 50 meters wide explodes 6 kilometers above the Earth's surface and releases over 100 times the energy of the first nuclear bombs. This flattens over several thousand square kilometers of forest, and it goes without saying that you would not have survived. This event occurred just over 100 years ago and was known as the Tunguska event. At the time, people had no idea what had happened because we didn't know much about asteroids. Scholars remained divided over whether or not anyone was killed by this event because it was such a remote region. However, what if it had landed over a major city? If this asteroid exploded over Sydney tomorrow, that would be catastrophic, but it could be even worse. A comet 10 kilometers wide has the potential to wipe out all human life or even all life on Earth. One the same size did the same thing for the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. It did this through a combination of the impact itself and the dust that it kicked up into the atmosphere, blocking out the sunlight and reducing global temperatures for years to come. There's a distinction I want to make clear here between a catastrophic threat and an existential threat. A catastrophic threat is bad because of the immediate damage it causes, while an existential threat is bad for that reason and also because it has the chance to wipe out all life. This would be bad not just for those alive today, but also for the future generations who would not get to exist. Other existential threats that have myself and other researchers concerned include supervolcanoes, global health pandemics, whether artificially engineered or natural, that could be worse than COVID-19, global thermonuclear warfare, and artificial gender intelligence scenarios. We need to be doing a lot more about these risks, despite their low probability, because of how high their impacts are. However, having said that, the UK royal astronomer Martin Rees estimates that humanity has just a 1 in 2 chance of making it to 2100. What keeps me especially up at night, though, is the possibility of an existential risk that we haven't even thought of yet. In the 16th century, Europeans had an expression of speech called a black swan, referring to an event that was extremely unlikely or just impossible. This is because all records of swans show that they were all white, and a black swan was inconceivable. Then in 1697, Dutch explorers discovered many black swans in Western Australia. Turns out they weren't that rare after all, it's just that no Europeans had seen one. In 2007, Nassim Nicholas Taleb wrote a book about black swans, saying they were events with positive or negative outcomes that no one could have predicted because nothing in the past can convincingly point to their probability. Can anyone think of a major unexpected event with global consequences that might have happened recently? Today I want to focus on harmful black swans. So COVID-19 was an example of a harmful black swan. Or was it? I'd argue that it's not quite fair to say that it was a black swan because people have been warning about the risk of a major zoonotic disease outbreak for years. Taleb recently said the same thing, calling COVID-19 a white swan, saying it was an event that would eventually happen with some great deal of certainty. Consider that Singapore had a plan in place for an event just like COVID-19 from around 2010, in part because of how heavily SARS affected them. Outside of China, they had the second worst number of cases and deaths from SARS. Learning from SARS, Singapore started building isolation hospitals, building negative pressure rooms, and putting in place legislation to deal with an event just like COVID-19. They acted fast in December, and were ready to go before the World Health Organization had declared an international health emergency. They were ready to go years ago, while other countries had to come up with a plan on the spot. If anything positive comes out of COVID-19, I hope it's that we can develop better disease control protocols, and look at how we can stop these events from happening in the first place, such as addressing sources of non-human-to-human -human disease transmission, like in wet markets and factory farms. I want to talk a little bit more about my area of research of asteroid impact mitigation. Asteroid impacts are much more likely than many people think. In fact, you're more likely to be killed by an asteroid impact than you are to be killed in a shark attack. Even though there are no confirmed cases of humans being killed by asteroid impacts, we have a pretty good idea of how often asteroids hit Earth and of how catastrophic they are when they do. And so we can still estimate how likely it is for someone to be killed by an asteroid impact. So what do we have in place today for asteroid mitigation? There are two aspects to this. There's detection and deflection. In terms of detection, we're doing pretty good. We think we've detected 100% of asteroids over the size of 10 kilometers, and 99% of asteroids over the size of one kilometer of those asteroids with a near-Earth orbit. Where we are more lacking is in deflection. Whilst we have many ideas of how we might deflect an asteroid, so far nothing has been tested. In 2017, we discovered an asteroid which we called Oumuamua, which we believe came from outside the solar system, which would make it the first asteroid that we know of to have done so. 
Luckily, space is huge, so it was never anywhere near us. But what if it was on a collision course with Earth? When we detected Oumuamua, it was around 85 times as far away from us as the Moon is. As a very rough estimate, if it had been on a collision course with Earth, it would have been just nine days away. Oumuamua was 230 meters long and 35 meters wide, so not quite big enough to be a dinosaur killer, but certainly big enough to wipe out a few cities. Another risk is if we have multiple catastrophic events that all occur at once. For example, we might be able to deal with a global health pandemic worse than COVID-19, an impending asteroid impact, and catastrophic climate change if they all happen separately, but if they all occur in the space of a few months, that may very well constitute a white or black swan event. The theme of these talks is, what can we learn while we're all apart? My hope is that we can use this unexpected event to think about how we can better prepare for future unexpected events. So what can we do about these events today? Things that we have not even thought of yet. And thinking about it is a good start. And I really mean that literally, because I think we've spent very little time even thinking about how we might solve something that comes up that we've never thought of before. Some possible solutions for how we can deal with black swan events. We can look at setting in place procedures today to deal with unforeseen risks, like making legislation to allow us to be more flexible. So allowing us to quickly adapt to unforeseen events that might arise. We can look at ensuring that actors are sufficiently exposed to the risks that they are involved in creating, which is known as the skin in the game principle. And this could be seen as reducing negative externalities. For example, if a company is sufficiently exposed to the risks that they're involved in creating, it might incentivize them to be more cautious. We can also look at how we can turn black swans into white swans. So how can we do more research and create better models to start thinking about what are some potential unknown unknowns that we haven't thought of yet. In conclusion, we've covered some black swans and some white swans. And my hope is that we can be better prepared for the white swans, to turn the black swans into white swans, and to put things in place now to be more prepared for when the next black swan comes, because it definitely will.